Thank you, uh, Arctic uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Holtus uh, with the World Ocean Council. We have now a session on uh, the Arctic Ocean and fisheries. Uh, I'm uh, co-chairing this with Thomas Haydar, who will be providing uh, some summary comments at the end of this session. Uh, I would note uh, for you that uh, from our uh, very uh, distinguished panel, we uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, our, our good friend uh, Sylvia Earle here is unable to make it due to uh, being involved in uh, expedition in a, in a warmer part of the world right now. Um, so we'll get started with the session. We're behind time, but we'll, we'll try and uh, do our best here to uh, make sure we cover the material and, and get to some questions and answers. <clears throat> Just by a uh, quick way of introduction, uh, to set the stage a bit, this is about fisheries, but I'd also like to, uh, to have you think about fisheries in a broader context at the, the organization I'm responsible for, the World Ocean Council, which is a multi-industry leadership alliance on, on ocean uh, sustainability and what we call corporate ocean responsibility. We also look at fisheries in the context of the other uses of the marine environment and ecosystem and, and ocean space. And I would encourage you to, again, to think about that, interactions between fisheries and other industries in the Arctic as uh, fisheries uh, expand and, 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 uh, and continue to play their role in the Arctic. And to think about the risks and opportunities of increased fishing activity uh, in the Arctic, the risks due to increased maritime traffic, for example, uh, with uh, fishing vessels, but also the opportunities. Particularly, I'd highlight the opportunity for fishing vessels operating in the Arctic to be helping us collect uh, data regarding ocean weather and climate conditions. Uh, and so uh, those are the kinds of things that may uh, help uh, us think about fisheries as a way to better understand and manage uh, Arctic ecosystems. Uh, but a lot of the focus here is on fishing activities and fisheries uh, themselves. And we're very uh, honored to uh, be able to start off this session with a keynote speech from Arnie Matheson, who is head of fisheries and aquaculture at the Food and Agricultural Organization. And so I'd uh, uh, ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Arnie to the podium. Co-chairs, <clears throat> excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by joining many, many others and complimenting the President of Iceland for his uh, foresight in, in uh, pulling us all here together and, uh, and his team for their agility in actually getting us all here. Then I would also like to congratu congratulate Iceland for having such a magnificent conference center and wish the uh, Arctic Circle Assembly and, and HARPA a very long and prosperous future to, together. The uh, question I would like to answer, or the two questions I'd like to answer, or try to answer, and then elaborate on a little bit, is why are Arctic fisheries important? And why is FAO interested? Why is the, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations interested in Arctic fisheries? And this is the reason. In spite of progress over the decades, there is still around a billion people hungry in this world. And in spite of progress, the prevalence is still between 10 and 20 percent. And in, in addition to around one billion people that are hungry, we have another billion which is suffering from various nutritional deficiencies, and then at least another billion that's suffering from obesity. And all of this invariably goes hand in hand with poverty. And when I'm speaking of poverty in this context, I'm not talking about the relative poverty we so often discuss here in the Nordic countries, but real abject poverty, a real crippling 
and killing poverty. And fish has an enormous contribution to human nutrition. Around 20% of our, our animal protein comes from, from fisheries in, in general, and a much higher proportion in the, the low-income food deficit countries. And in the countries which have the, uh, the lowest rate of animal protein intake, the proportion of, of fish intake is much higher than elsewhere. In addition to the, the protein, the uh, various other nutritional elements, the vitamins and minerals, and the omega-3s play a large role in nutrition. And as many of you have, have heard, Homo sapiens didn't start to think rationally until he moved down to the coast and started eating fish. And in fact, our brain is made out of omega-3 fatty acids. And this drawing of a small pelagic fish, this is a, a perfect one-day ration of all the nutritional elements that we need. In addition here, we see the the value chain, about 12% of the population of the world rely on their livelihoods on fisheries. And the most important food, food commodity for the developing countries, the most net traded food commodity for the de developing countries is fish. If you think of all the, 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 the coffee, the rice, the beef and the chicken, fish top them all. And in the context of FAO's strategic goals, eradicating hunger, eliminating poverty, and sustainable management of and utilization of natural resources, fish is therefore very important, and the Arctic is therefore very important. And we base our Blue Growth Initiative on these facts. But then let's turn to climate change. Climate change is a fact that nobody tries to deny anymore. It has variable effects. It affects the, the, the coral reefs, the, the shellfish, and it is a, a part of the dead zones that are accumulating in various places of our, our oceans. But what concerns us is the effects on, on fish and fish stocks and how climate change is affecting their displacement and possible reduction. And this is from the IPCC panel. And this shows you, based on temperature changes from the last decade to the projections to the middle of, of this century, how fish catches are estimated to, to change in the world's oceans. The red colors and the yellow colors, they denote reduction. White is neutral, but the green and the blue colors, they denote an increase. This is based on temperatures and sort of de derived comfort zones for, for fish. And you can see from this that fish will be moving from the lower latitudes around the equator to the higher latitudes particularly to the north, to the north more than actually to the south. So the fisheries potential is going to be increasing in the Arctic region and in the subarctic region. What is also a cause for concern that the conditions for fish in coastal regions are going to, to uh, deteriorate and uh, and there where the, the most sensitive fisheries around the equator or the, the poorest populations, we are going to be, be facing problems and we will have to make up for that somewhere else. In the Arctic, we have already seen various changes in, in major, major species. Uh, I don't want to dwell on this because I believe Johan Sigurdsson will go into greater detail on the various species and how, 
They at the Marine Research Institute here in Iceland have ex experienced this here on the, in the North Atlantic. But we are seeing <coughs> these changes elsewhere as well, in the Pacific Ocean as well, both with re regards to, to, to crabs and mollusks, as well as to, to mammals. But certainly, this is not all negative. There are opportunities, even commercial opportunities that are, are, uh, are emerging in, out, out of this, this picture. But are we, are we prepared for this? And what are the structures that we use to, to manage our oceans? The main instruments are, of course, UNCLOS and the UN Fish Stocks agreements, as well as the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries and the various related instruments. And the main fora for discussion of fisheries management on a global basis is in the UN General Assembly and in the FAO Committee on, on Fisheries. But in all of this, the primary responsibility is on the, the sovereign states. They have responsibility for their EEZs. And then on, in the areas beyond national jurisdiction, they have the responsibility to cooperate in, according to the, the various clauses of both UNCLOS and UN fish stocks. And the prime instrument there is the, the RFMOs, the Regional Fisheries Management Organization. And if we look at the, the Arctic re region, we see that the Arctic region, obviously depending on how, how we define it, is only partially covered by RFMOs. The pink area is the, the NEAFC area, the North Atlantic <coughs> Fisheries Commission, which is the, uh, the, the fisheries commission which sort of covers this uh, fairly large sliver of the, the sort of the conventional area uh, beyond the, the Arctic Circle. NAFO, the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission, also covers a, a bit of it, but doesn't extend as, as far north, doesn't ex actually extend to the pole like the, the NEAF area does. And then in the Pacific, the commissions there don't actually uh, reach uh, further than the Bering Strait and are not actually in the conventional Arctic. But if you extend the, the region further south, even into the Aleutians, then they obviously come into to play. But then, in particular, the, the species-specific uh, Bering Sea Pollock and, and Halibut organizations. But then also in the, um, in the, um, in the Atlantic, we have the ICAT area, the, the, the Tuna Commission area, which extends up and beyond the, uh, the Arctic Circle. And here we see in closer detail the, the areas that the um, the, the NEAF controls, and, um, and they have actually already prepared strategies on how to react if and when the, the fisheries move into the, the more central Arctic. And just to, to close, a few considerations for sustainable fisheries development in the Arctic. And we basically need a more holistic approach, a cross-sectoral approach to this. And that is in, in three areas. It's fisheries, the wider environment, and the communities for the, the, the people. We need to safeguard the environment. We need to ensure sustainable fisheries management in the face of greater uncertainty than we have seen before. And I think we need to look at new ways of, 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 of managing. We can't be as certain about the future as we have been in the past. There were 20 years ago some good ideas about how to manage the, uh, the pelagic complex in the North Atlantic on, um, on sort of uh, changing the allocation depending on how the uh, the distribution was changing with, with time on a, on a regular basis. I think we need to look at things like that. And in the South Pacific, in the tuna management, the, the new day scheme there is specifically set up to be prepared to react to changes in the, in the South Pacific 
which are predicted to be on the, on the distribution of, of tuna, the, the fishing probably moving further to the east, and there are inbuilt flexibility factors to um, allow the, uh, the fishing fleets to react to that. I think there are things like that that we need to look at in the future. We need to have uh, adaptive actions in, in the regions. The livelihoods are of immense importance to those that, that, that live in the Arctic region. They may not comparatively with the world population be, be many, but they live in a, a very sensitive region where they have been for thousands of years been in harmony with the, with the environment, which is now changing. And they definitely need support to, to tackle these changes. But above all, we need new agreements on responsible fisheries, on how we, we, we plan and how we plan to develop the, the fisheries in the, in the Arctic, how the fisheries coexist with other utilizations of the environment, and that we can only do through agreements, and those agreements need to be based on UNCLOS, UN Fish Stocks, and the FAO Code of Conduct. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnie. No one better to give us a big picture view of, of the Arctic fishery situation than, than Arnie. Next, we have uh, Michael Jones. Michael is the Chief Technology Advocate for Google, and please join me in welcoming Michael to the podium. Thank you. When I think about anything, I think what's the greatest possible outcome? What, what, what preconceptions limit that outcome? What actions would ensure that outcome? Now, I always think about that all the time, whatever it is, even driving, I always think about that. When I think about the ocean and you know, the one silver lining perhaps of climate change is we have a new ocean that's gonna be more widely enjoyed than ever before. My first thought, because I'm at Google and because I'm the kind of person that would be at Google, is I think about the people of the world. I think of the ocean as something that belongs to people. And I wanna know how can we connect people to their ocean. That's a first thought. Like, if, if governments are a reflection of the will of the people, then good behavior is going to become, is going to be required to, to have a, a public interest in the ocean itself. So I think, how do we take people to the ocean? How do we take them there? How do we make them feel the majesty of it? How do people understand it? How can scientists do a better job both of learning and of sharing to direct and encourage public thought and will? So those are the things I think about. And one of the things I'm proud of, uh, Jennifer, who's here with me, she set up this Google underwater street view system, and that picture of that particular turtle is the most seen image underwater in the history of mankind. Okay? Now, now I guess our, you know, number two would be Jacques Cousteau. He did some pictures. The thing is, there's a picture from the Apollo days of the Earth from the moon. That everyone's seen that picture. That's the most seen picture. Underwater, that's the equivalent picture, which in a way is kind of sad because that isn't the only good thing in the ocean, right? That just shows you how little we know about the largest part of our planet and how little attention we give to the most fragile part of our planet. So at Google, we think, well, what can we do about that? And what do we have to offer? Well, what we have is we have computers, okay? <laughs> so this is uh, half of a Google data center. It's about 50,000 computers in a room. And just, as, just, as a, just so you know, when you do a Google search, it goes to one of these rooms, and your search goes to every single computer in parallel. They each do their part of the internet for your search. It all comes back together again, and it comes to you. So we do that. Every time you do a Google search, use all of those computers. The lights flash whenever you do a search. So we said, what could we do? So if we just had data, we could really do something. So we met some people, a company called SpaceQuest. They built these little baby satellites that you see here, and they launched it in Russia. And uh, it's, it's been collecting data now for quite some time. And what you'll see in the background here, you'll see uh, emerge some red lines. And those red lines are tracks of ships, and those ships move over time. And this is uh, an example that has long been sort of possible for governments, but uh, uh, usually in important theaters of conflict or in conflicted areas or in nearshore ports and harbors. But the idea of a global situational awareness of where every ship is, it, not the word every, uh, hopefully you see some red there, yeah, so in the St. Lawrence Seaway you see some action, and 
And so you'll see some more and more. So the, this notion of every here is not every, because not every ship is instrumented to voluntarily contribute its location. Not every ship, uh, for example, AIS, uh, not every ship is instrumented in the uh, Icelandic method of a, little bit, a different kind of signal. Uh, in some ships, uh, uh, nefarious kernel, uh, unauthorized illegal fishing ships uh, turn their AIS, AIS off. But uh, nonetheless, the ability to slowly measure and observe every ship at sea every single day, several times a day, is the gateway to a better kind of stewardship of the oceans worldwide. It's simply you can't manage what you can't measure. And if you can't measure ships, then you certainly can't measure how ships are used uh, for fishing or otherwise. So here we have this planet of data about where the, where the ships are. Space Quest helped us do that. We took that same data, the same technique, and applied that to a larger set of data, tracking buoys in the ocean, which gives us currents, tracking shipping around the world. And what you can see here is the, 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 the Earth is alive with ships. And we all know that, those of us that love the ocean. But, but most people don't know that. So here we can help a billion people a day, our users, understand what's going on in the sea. And more importantly, I think, not only to increase their interest in the sea, but we can help governments and others take action. If you see people from some other country coming to the edge of your EEZ and parking their big fishing fleet, and then suddenly their AS goes off, and then two weeks later they go back home and they unload a ship full of fish, then maybe your ambassador should call them, right? And this kind of record is, uh, is, is the starting point for uh, an interesting conversation between government officials. And it's public data, so it doesn't betray any, any uh, you know, unshareable uh, national technical means that make otherwise prohibit uh, open sharing of such information. And this is actually not moving, it's moving beyond uh, radio data, but also visual. This is video taken from space by Skybox. This is a satellite photography of taking uh, motion video uh, that we, we bought this company a few months ago. These guys have done a great job of advancing the notion of how much the Earth can we see. With a const they have two satellites now, but when they get to 30 or 40 satellites, they're going to have a, a synoptic view of the planet every single day, what things look like. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is our planet is half clouds, so they'll have a good view of half the clouds as well. But uh, still, uh, places like here, here's a ship moving in the, in the video, uh, natural effects. So the, the idea of a world that you can see from space that's observed all the time, the European Space Agency Sentinel satellite with a radar satellite that sees through clouds all the time, uh, AIS tracking all the time, and all this data being collected and presented to anyone who cares about it for fisheries management, for uh, interdiction of, of illegal uh, transshipments, whatever it is, th that, that's the present reality. So if you're sitting there thinking, someday that will be great, then what you're really doing is you're stealing from your country the, the, the results that you already could give them. This is a today thing. This isn't a future thing. That isn't even the new thinking. New thinking is things like this. This is a, a wave adaptive vehicle that when it, when it if, look at the pontoons or the sponsons as it moves here, you'll see a, as it turns around, it's actually moving its feet to fit over the water and keeping the platform relatively stable. So Jennifer funded that to work on how to capture street view of harbors and not have the camera move around too much. So this is being used in military for swarming vehicles. You know, if you don't like somebody, you can send these after them with machine guns on top. Um, here in, here in, in, in Iceland, they did, the track well does the, a, a different kind of tracking, and there's something very subtle about what, what they do in Iceland. In case you don't know, one of the brilliance, this is incredibly brilliant, those of you that are in the political realm, sometimes you know people are wrong, but you don't know what to do about it. It's not so wrong that you can't, it's not so wrong you can shoot them, but it's not so good that you want to leave them alone. So what they do in Iceland, because they're so clever at this, is they decided the ocean is very dangerous, the water is very cold. Fishermen that go overboard or ships that sink, people will die. So in respect for safety of life at sea treaties, they have the helicopters ready on a moment's notice. As soon as your signal, your AS tracking signal or similar signal disappears, they launch the helicopters for your ship. They're going to save you. When they get there, if you're not sinking, you pay for the helicopters. Right? Isn't that fantastic? That's, that's an economic punitive measure for, for illicit captains who turn their AS off because they're doing naughty things. But the other thing that Trackwell does that I like is they actually capture the data about the fish from the capture all the way through processing, and they print a, basically a barcode with the fish so you can know where that fish came from. 
That, that's the, if, if the world was like Iceland, that's how it would be at your, at your, at your grocery store. Sainsbury would have that. Safeway would have that. You don't have that because you're not like Iceland, right? All right? But if you were, it would be. That's fantastic. Now, the other thing that's fantastic is this, this U.S. Uh, Navy built this, this system called Sea Vision. They let people use it. It's being used widely in the, all around the coast of Africa to track ships. And what's most interesting about it is this MSSIS, this MSSIS thing. These are all the countries that signed on to share ship location data to create a, a connected, informed planet so that wise governance would be possible. Hopefully your country's on that list. If it's not, shame on you, okay? You should get on that list. If you're not on that list, uh, I'm, talk to me. I, I'm gonna spank you. So there are also, another country like Portugal is not a ma major world superpower, but in the oceans it is, and intellectually it is. They've done a great amount of work, not only in building remote ocean observing vehicles, but in gathering their data together and making them work as integrated systems. So they can send out a dozen kinds of vehicles to see what's actually happening in the fisheries, report back. And they work with many countries and many governments to do that. They've done a really good job about that. And the final point I would make has about governance. So this is the Arctic Sea, the future Arctic Sea without its ice. Only 11% of that has been, or less than that perhaps, has been accurately surveyed. What dangers wait, we don't know. Those monsters that were in the old maps, they're all in the Arctic Sea, okay? So we need a much better regime of measurement, of observation, and the political opportunity as people seek entrance to this sea to do what President Grimson has done, is to say, yes, you can come, we welcome you, we'll share with you, but you've got to play nice. You've got to have an Icelandic quality of fishing. And I hope you'll all accept that challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that uh, very interesting uh, look at things from the technology side and how we can work to improve our knowledge of the Arctic. Uh, next, we would uh, like to welcome Johan Sigurdsson, if I did that well enough uh, to welcome, and obviously I'm not Icelandic. Uh, please welcome Johan to uh, talk about fisheries from the, from the Icelandic uh, perspective. Thanks. Co-chair, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to have the opportunity to talk to you here today. Uh, I've been working uh, with research on the living resources of the seas around Iceland for quite a long time, uh, including uh, having responsibility for uh, providing advice uh, on sustainable harvest of the resources in, in our waters. In such a short uh, presentation, uh, I might almost uh, like to go to the conclusion, my two points. But I would like to uh, reflect on the changing conditions in northern waters on the Arctic Ocean, where natural variability uh, can actually have even greater uh, impacts on the system uh, than uh, predicted global warming uh, effects. Uh, we need cooperation here. Uh, then I would like to reflect on uh, some dramatic shifts in distribution and abundance of uh, important fish stocks in, uh, in, uh, in northern waters, uh, where cooperation in gathering information has taken place and quite successfully. Uh, I would like to dwell a little bit with the so-called pelagic complex in the North Atlantic, which, is a, uh, uh, which are three important pelagic stocks, extremely valuable pelagic stocks that are shared among nations in the North Atlantic Ocean uh, and are subject for international uh, management uh, regime. We claim in Iceland that the seas around Iceland are a large-scale laboratory for studying impacts of climate variability on the living marine resources, since Iceland is on the border of warm and cold sea currents and where the sea surface temperature is ranging from below zero to 12, uh, 13 degrees. Also, uh, natural fluctuations uh, caused by non-human uh, variations in ocean conditions occur. And here we see how things have been developing uh, 
of Iceland, of Northern Iceland, the last 140 years, with warm and cold periods, and these various, uh, variations are indeed more dramatic than the predicted increase in ocean temperature around Iceland the next century. So we have been uh, influenced by great uh, chances in uh, the modern environment around Iceland, and we have uh, made great efforts to try to explore and understand uh, the dynamics of these chances and uh, how they impact uh, the modern life in our waters. Uh, here you see uh, a graph showing um, a cruise uh, expedition that was conducted in August, September 2008. It's quite an expensive activity to send a vessel for a prolonged period of time to explore uh, the ocean around Iceland. And uh, when we think about, uh, when we think about the, the huge Arctic area, which we need to understand and explore in the coming years, uh, a one vessel survey for one month or two months is, is a drop in, in, in the ocean. So, uh, so uh, we need, uh, there's a strong need for coordinated effort in the Arctic Ocean and at the Asian seas in order to map and understand the ongoing chances, dynamics of the system and future scenarios. This is a huge task which requires concerted action of the international community. And when we look at the tiny area around Iceland here shown in red and yellow, which represents one of the richest fishing grounds in the world, and then we look at the uh, Arctic areas, which may be open for fisheries and, uh, and uh, activities in the future, uh, it is obvious that, uh, that uh, uh, this is a subject that is of great interest for, for for human mankind, I would say. Um, just to look at the pelagic complex, which are the three species I mentioned earlier. Uh, they are extremely valuable in the North Atlantic Ocean. They are extremely sensitive for uh, uh, temperature uh, variations. They simply move where the conditions are favorable. Um, and um, so they would be candidates to invade the Arctic seas. They are not restricted to the continental shelves like most of the demersal fish stocks, uh, but obviously they need much food and uh, they compete each other. Here we see uh, first uh, the, uh, the, the, the cablin, which is a cold water species, pelagic species, and then uh, the, the pelagic complex species, herring, blue whiting, and mackerel. So they cover a huge geographic range and compete. In the warm, uh, in, in the cold water uh, period, uh, say prior to 1995, uh, the total biomass of these three species was in the range of six to eight million metric ton, uh, uh, tons, a million tons. Uh, one third to one half of what it has been in the most recent years when productivity has increased due to warming up in the North Atlantic Ocean. So there are great poten economic potentials in sustainable uh, future harvest of pelagic stocks, and also, of course, in some demersal stocks in the high north. Uh, there has been successful cooperation in research of these resources, but more efforts are needed, obviously. The great displacement of North Atlantic resources in recent years will repeat itself in the Arctic in the future uh, for these and other species. But unfortunately, the cruel fact is that the civilized North Atlantic nations with economic strength and scientific knowledge are not able to manage these uh, um, important uh, resources in harmony. So this is something that we need to look at because it will repeat itself in the Arctic. We have the same tasks to, to address in the future. Uh, when it comes to uh, expansion of uh, these stocks into the northern waters and Arctic seas. Just to mention one uh, additional stock, which is the cold water species, uh, Cablin. It will invade to the northern more waters if uh, things will develop as we envisage. Uh, and just to make my Google friend happy, this is a map showing the distribution, the past distribution of, of, of the Cablin, Iceland, uh, Greenland, uh, Cablin stock uh, in the 1990s. 
it, and the, how the stock has been moving to west and north uh, in the most recent years due to the warming up. So what will happen in the future? Will we have emerging cabling stocks? We have cabling stock in the Pacific. We have cabling stock of Newfoundland, Iceland, and in the Barents Sea. How will these um, stocks interact? That's the future question. To conclude, there is a strong need for co coordinated scientific research to document, explore, and understand the ocean, uh, ongoing physical oceanographic changes in the Arctic Ocean and adjacent seas. And we have to understand that single nation efforts is insufficient. We need concerted action to accomplish the great task ahead. And we also need to understand the impacts of, of these physical changes on the living resources of the ocean. Um, and finally, I think it is of fundamental uh, importance uh, that we develop a more efficient and safe management mechanism uh, under changing environmental conditions. Uh, and I would like to make that to my final word. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Johan, uh, Director General of the Icelandic uh, Marine Research Institute. Very uh, concise and important uh, statement there, and one of the most uh, brief uh, scientific presentations I've ever heard. Congratulations on that. Uh, next, and I mean that in a, in a serious uh, congratulatory way. Uh, next, we have uh, uh, Jill and Maxwell uh, from the Terramar Foundation to, to uh, present to us. So please welcome Jill. Thank you. The weather is very, very important to us. It actually affects every single aspect of our lives. Before I came to Iceland, I checked the weather. I'm super happy that I did. My umbrella was handy last night. I'm sure it was for many of you. Uh, farmers, are it's essential for farming, when to plant the crops, when to take uh, and when to harvest the crops. So I'm delighted today for the first time to be able to have the weather channel uh, have a look at what's happening for the first time in history, actually, in the high seas. Thank you so much, Gillian. And we've got wonderful new technology here at the Weather Channel, and we are able to deliver a point forecast for the Arctic high seas. And we'll take one location that is north of the northernmost part of Canada, near the Mian Islands. And as you might expect, it's going to be very chilly indeed here. Temperatures will, for the most part, only get up into the negative 20s Celsius through the entire week. So you want to take an extra pair of knickers should you be here anytime soon. And we'll take you to another spot on the other side of the Arctic Ocean, and that is north of Russia, northeast of the Anzu Islands, and similarly, it's going to be quite cold, temperatures in the negative numbers all across the board right through the end of the week, getting a little bit warmer going into Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Now back to you in Iceland. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm obviously thrilled today because that is a first for the Arctic. It is a first for the high seas, and it's a first for the Weather Channel. So what's this focus on the weather? It, it's really exciting, of course, that now for the first time in history, we have the weather for the high seas in the Arctic. Uh, that's about 1% of the high seas in total. But what that really means is that almost half the planet, we have no weather for. Think about that for a second. That's almost half the planet that we don't have full, and, uh, full data for the weather. And as we know with our friends from Google and our friends from the fisheries, data is key, especially in today's world. So as exciting that is, I just want to talk a little bit about exploration. So we spend, uh, NASA's uh, space exploration budget is about 250 times more than that of our ocean exploration budget. That might explain some of the reasons for the holes in our ocean exploration. Um, to put this into perspective, on the right-hand side, that's a picture of James Cameron going down to the bottom of the ocean at about 36,000 feet, of which only three people in the history of our planet have ever gone down to the bottom of the ocean. By contrast, 
the very good looking chap on the left is our space moonwalker and we've had 12 people who have walked on the moon. It's, uh, it's strange because we've only just started to map really the bottom of the ocean and we're mapping the ocean now at about two and a half kilometers. But just to put that into perspective for you, we map the moon to about seven, between seven meters and a hundred meters, which is crazy when you think of, of that. Um, and also what's odd is that since in the last 40 years since we've been to the moon, uh, we've brought back about 850 pounds of moon rocks. Again, by contrast, we take out between 100 and about 130 billion worth of fish, tons of fish, a year. Now, the variable, as many of you will know, is because we don't really know what, uh, what the value is on the illegal fishing department, because boats, as we know, not all boats are tracked. There are about 15% only of boats that are tracked, for instance, in the high seas. And just, I would like you to think about this for a second. Uh, I'd like to know how many of you would like to fly on a plane if only 15% of planes were talking to air traffic control? Anyone? Or again, perhaps, if who'd like to go driving, especially in Manhattan, where I'm from, it seems a little bit... Uh, more comfortable here in Iceland, if only 15% of the drivers had license plates. We all know, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a speed demon, so I'd be whipping through those red lights as long as I knew that no one was tracking me. But what that means on the high seas is that we don't really know what all those fishing vessels are doing. At any given time, there are literally hundreds of boats out there that are fishing, and that allows them to blow through the quotas, and it allows them to fish for endangered species because the the, uh, the chances that they'll be captured are, are frankly less. Uh, and so that's a problem because it's putting a lot of pressure on the fishing stocks. You might have been uh, happy to, uh, when you ordered that tuna the other night, I think many of you will know that you were potentially you know, ingesting a little bit of mercury, but were you all down for some food poisoning if you had tuna with some other species because they estimate that about 30% of all the fish that you eat are fraudulently labeled. That's a problem, I think, especially if you get jippy tummy. Um, how many of you have this in your hand today? Yes, I can see a lot of you. Every piece of plastic that has ever been created is still in existence. This bag we use and discard one trillion of these a year. What this means is that that plastic, a large percentage of that plastic, ends up in our oceans. And as you can see from this map, we have five giant gyres of plastic. We have, in fact, so much plastic in our ocean that the new state of garbage for real, has just been recognized by UNESCO. So I think you all knew about the countries, you know, ice and so on, but anyone been to visit garbage yet? I've been, it's not very pretty. Um, but all joking aside, what we uh, take out of, what we put in, what we take out of the ocean is being dwarfed by what we'd be put in the ocean, such as the plastic. Uh, this is a picture of Fukushima. We've had 32 million becquerels of radioactive waste that have gone into the ocean since the disaster. Um, BP spill, uh, it, its effects are still being felt today and still being uh, understood. Mahi Mahi, for instance, they've just discovered a f uh, swimming slower because of the spill. And the spill affected not just the area around uh, the BP oil rig, but it went out for almost 68,000 square kilometers. All of this is creating uh, impacts on the ocean that we're familiar with, uh, overheating, it's heating, and it's acidifying. So it's putting pressures not just on fishing stocks, as we heard today, of a species who prefer colder water, who are swimming into colder areas, but also in the last 10 years, uh, American 
uh, shellfish production is off by about 40% because it's harder for shellfish to create the, the, the shells that they need in the, carbonate, in the new carbon environment that they're living in. So I just want to think, we've all been talking about a giant piece of the ocean. That's a dot of the ocean. That's one little dot. Now, that one little dot on that person's finger contains 12,000 microbes. Each one of those microbes has a job to do. Um, some of them are food, and some of them are creating oxygen. So the question I'd like you to think about is if that one dot can do all those things, if you change the chemistry of that one dot or you change the chemistry of billions of dots, what is that doing to our ocean? So I have a sort of an answer for you. This was produced out of a bipartisan report that came out uh, just a month ago, a, month, a couple of months ago, uh, with some quantifiable costs to climate change, $35 billion in uh, storm damage, 14% uh, decrease in yields of wheat farmers, $12 billion additional spent on AC to keep cool, with about $100 million expected in the coming years uh, from flooding. Secretary Kerry recently described the ocean as a national security threat, and Hegel Defense Secretary described the climate change as a disaster multiplier. So we all, it, it uh, was Halloween yesterday, I'm scared of ghosts and we can all be scared of things. I know there are things, Ebola and so on. Most of us don't think actually, you know, we're scared irrationally maybe of spiders or snakes. I would argue that in this time that maybe we should be more scared of the ocean. I think that's a really scary problem that we should all address. As we all know, bringing it back to the Arctic, the sixth lowest Arctic ice coverage in September, and that has led to the opening of the Arctic. So four cruise vessels have uh, just gone through, and it's having an impact. It's changing things. So what can we do? I'm going to wrap up very fast here. I'd like, I'd like to suggest that maybe we should be bold, and we should be, you know, on top of all the things that we know, maybe you should think of some strange things. So I'd like to propose two solutions. One is a currency, a digital currency for social good based on our joint ownership of the global commons, which would place a value on fish never previously placed before, and use all the profits to go back in to pay for things that governments have a hard time paying for. And the second thing that I would like to propose is that we all jointly own our global commons. We own 45% of the planet, it is ours. And though each and every one of us here are uh, represented by a company or a country, we all each have an individual stake and interest in this. And so I think becoming citizens of our global commons, coming together in one united community around our shared love and need of the ocean might also be that. And I am part of the Terramar Project. I invite you all to get your passport so that you become not only citizens of where you're from, but you also become joint citizens of land and sea, because we all have a stake and an interest in this, and we need to connect to it in a new way. Thank you. Thank you, Yelen. Uh, and now uh, to move on uh, to our, our last but uh, by no means least uh, uh, speaker, we have Susan Heckley from uh, the uh, Program and Negotiation at uh, Harvard Law School. Susan, please welcome Susan. Thank you. I am delighted to be here today to participate in this, in this important conference. And I look forward to talking with you about a few strategies and suggestions for how we can think about negotiating and managing complex issues relating to the Arctic. I'm here on behalf of um, my university research center, the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School. It's a consortium program of three universities, Harvard, MIT, and Tufts. But I'm also here uh, just as importantly as someone who cares very deeply about the Arctic. I lived for 15 years in Alaska, nine of those years in a log cabin in the mountains with no running water or electricity. 
I also serve on the board of directors of Trustees for Alaska, an environmental law firm that represents the, the interests of many Arctic clients. So in September, at the request of President Grimson, the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School, where I work, convened an all-day meeting on the subject of Arctic fisheries. The meeting was held in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States. By way of background, the program on negotiation uh, has worked for 30 years now to develop the theory and practice of negotiation and to help people think about how to manage conflict, build lasting relationships, and create sustainable agreements. <clears throat> We've learned how to help people in challenging disputes work together on issues so that each party is able to express his or her viewpoint and feel understood. Uh, also that everyone feels the process is fair and productive and that in these meetings people can <clears throat> be creative and propose solutions in a spirit of open brainstorming. So at the program on negotiation, when we get involved in large scale meetings, we care not only about what is said, but what is the process and how is it said and does it lead to good agreements. So you all are leaders coming from your countries and organizations. And as you think of yourselves as negotiators, uh, we believe negotiation is a core leadership skill that will help you build consensus, stay open to learning, use your influence and power of persuasion wisely and help get agreements over the finish line. As we all know, generating international agreement on anything is difficult. And that's particularly true of complex multi-party, multi-issue negotiations. We give an award every year to someone we call the great negotiator, someone who's demonstrated outstanding skill over a lifetime of challenging negotiations. I want to mention one of these people. Last spring, we honored Ambassador Tommy Koh of Singapore as a great negotiator for his leadership of international negotiations, such as the Law of the Sea and the Rio Earth Summit. In his acceptance remarks, Tommy Coe talked about how people representing small constituencies can make sure they have a place at the table. They can form coalitions, really try to understand the other side's interests and respond to those. Tommy Coe talked about how when you are managing large negotiations, you need to be uh, skillful at both miniaturizing, making smaller the discussion, and also expanding it as needed. He reminded us at the beginning of wisdom is to understand we all live in our own cultural boxes. That means we need to know our own limitations and be eager to learn from others who are in their own cultural boxes, whether it's fisheries, resource development, environmental protection, government, or the communities of those who live in the far north. So the Arctic Devising Seminar that we held at Harvard was a special one-day collaborative problem-solving session designed to use core, collaborative, uh, core negotiating principles. Ahead of the seminar, a team from Harvard and MIT conducted a stakeholder assessment. They interviewed some 50 people to gain an understanding of their interests and perspective on a set of issues relating to Arctic fisheries. This assessment document was distributed to the participants of the devising seminar in advance of their meeting so that when we met to have a discussion, we started on a very high level of shared understanding. At the meeting, <clears throat> we had 23 participants from 10 countries representing a wide range of stakeholder groups. They engaged as individuals rather than in their official capacities. To encourage openness, it was agreed beforehand that remarks would not be attributed to any individual. MIT professor Lawrence Suskind, a founder of the Program on Negotiation and a leading scholar on managing complex disputes, led the all-day session. Uh, here are some of the topics of what we discussed and some of the thoughts expressed. So on the topic of risks to Arctic fisheries, participants agreed that there are really a wide range of risks including but not limited to climate change and the related impact on ecosystems, potential competing uses, including shipping and resource extraction, and the threat of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. The participants also felt that it's important to differentiate between different geographic zones 
and between talking about existing and possible future fisheries. With considerable uncertainty around if or even when there will be a viable fishery in the Central Arctic Ocean, there nevertheless is clearly a need for understanding what that impact would be on fisheries of different activities in the Arctic. Regarding conservation of fishing stocks, most participants felt that interim measures should govern actions as long as there's a clear understanding of what kind of triggers would signal a move from those interim measures to the next phase of fisheries management. There was wide agreement that the gaps in our scientific understanding of Arctic fisheries and the associated ecosystems seriously impacts our ability to plan. We need to push for significant investments in money, time, and resources to address these uh, significant monitoring and scientific gaps. To do this well, it'll be critical to have collaboration among research groups and various stakeholders. Universities and existing research organizations have an important role to play, and a new research organization specifically dedicated to Arctic studies should be considered. Participants also express their commitment to making sure that indigenous peoples are not only heard, but are understood and truly valued. There needs to be a sincere and two-way transfer of knowledge between indigenous peoples and other decision makers. And we need an appreciation that indigenous peoples are not a monolithic group, but contain many different points of view on development and protection. Regarding possible new management arrangements, we discuss the need for a precautionary approach <clears throat> while building up a knowledge base of the relevant science. Negotiating partnerships, private, public, otherwise, can coordinate research and monitoring and facilitate ongoing communication. That will be essential. The devising seminar produced a statement of forward-thinking ideas and bridging proposals that we believe can advance the global conversation and infuse official negotiations with ways of reframing what seem like irreconcilable positions. So negotiation experts often ask, how should we frame this discussion? If your frame is too narrow, some parties and issues are left out. If it's too broad a frame, it can be unmanageable. Negotiation experts also ask, how do we operate in conditions of uncertainty? How do we build consensus and make real progress in planning for the future? What's your tolerance for risk? Where can we find common ground? And what are the points of difference? So why is coming to agreement so hard? Some of the barriers to productive discussions can include people have different views on the urgency of the problem. People can be reluctant to share information or be skeptical about the facts. Uh, there can be disagreement about what process to use. And there can be a lack of clarity, uh, what are the goals of these talks? So at the program on negotiation, we believe that the process we use to reach and talk about global agreements can be just as important as the technical understanding we all bring to the table. In fact, good technical solutions may be unattainable if we're not able to bridge our cultural and ideological differences. We encourage you to look at the summary report of the meeting that we held to see if there are ideas that might work for your discussions. We believe that this type of meeting, where you have careful work done ahead of time, where you're able to gather ideas and concerns without attribution, and where the discussion starts at a high shared level of understanding, that these kinds of meetings can be a model for future talks on the full spectrum of issues relating to understanding and safeguarding this place we all love, the Arctic. Thank you very much, Susan. And uh, I would uh, like to thank and congratulate all of the speakers for being so sharp and focused and timely uh, with, their, with their presentations. Uh, as mentioned, uh, our co-chair uh, for this session is Thomas Haydar, and I think we can say uh, the, the newest uh, judge on the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, so we're quite honored to have him here. Thomas has some concluding remarks, and then we'll manage the, uh, the question process uh, for the amount of time we have for that. So, Thomas. Thank you, Paul, and, and thanks to all the speakers for their very different but uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, statements. 
I would like to leave you with just two <coughs> kind of concluding remarks. Uh, first, I would like to point to the different challenges we have in the different parts of the Arctic Ocean. I think that's a very important point. We have uh, here the Northeast Atlantic, and here we have the Northwest Atlantic. And in both these areas, we have already established fishery, uh, more or less fully exploited fish stocks. And we have uh, regional fisheries management organizations, NAFO in the Northwest Atlantic and NIAFC in the Northeast Atlantic, that are responsible for managing high seas fisheries in these areas. Uh, now, the challenges in the Northeast Atlantic, and I think Johan Sigurjons mentioned a few of those, I, I think maybe the, the, the new challenge there is the change in migration pattern of fish stocks, especially the pelagic stocks. Uh, obviously, this uh, poses a challenge to research, but not, not, not less to fisheries management. I was in my former life a uh, negotiator of Iceland on mackerel fisheries. It has been a challenge uh, in, in the Northeast Atlantic. And it is difficult enough to uh, negotiate the allocation of quotas between states on stocks, even if they keep their migration patterns more or less stable from one year to the other. It is difficult enough, but it becomes even more difficult if the migration pattern changes, as has been the case in the Northeast Atlantic, where these pelagic stocks have been moving further north and west uh, from, from previous years. So uh, uh, the, the uh, distribution of stocks is a very important uh, criteria when states are negotiating uh, allocation of stocks. And so fluctuations in the migration is, is, a, is a challenge to the negotiators, obviously. Uh, in the Central Arctic Ocean, uh, for comparison, uh, we do not have, in principle, any, uh, any established fishery there, except in some, some parts of the exclusive economic zones. But on this high seas area, the dark blue area, we do not have any fishery, and, and this area is more or less covered with ice. Uh, so, and this area also is not covered by any regional fisheries management organization, except for this small part here, which is part of the NIAFC area, the, the yellow area here. So, so this is this important, this, there is an important difference between these parts of the Arctic Ocean and uh, necessary to have in mind. The other point I would like to make is that uh, we do not have a legal gap in the Arctic Ocean. We have the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention that basically provides the legal framework for all the marine zones and all the uses of the oceans including uh, the Arctic. And this applies, for example, to the continental shelf, uh, shipping, and fisheries. When it comes to the uh, future fisheries in the high seas area of the Central Arctic Ocean, there is a further treaty that is particularly important. That is the 1995 UN Fish Stocks Agreement in Icelandic called Uthafsreyði Samningurinn. This agreement, uh, provides a legal framework for high seas fisheries. And I'd just like to describe very briefly how that agreement can be applied and should be applied in the Central Arctic Ocean in the future. The objective of the UN Fish Stocks Agreement is the conservation and long-term sustainable use of fish stocks. So with, in other words, if there are fish stocks that can be commercially used, they should be used, but in a sustainable manner. We have something called the precautionary approach that stems from Rio, but was uh, put into the UN Fisheries Agreement, which is a very modern environmental agreement. And this approach would suggest that fishing states shall be more cautious when information of, on status of fish stocks is, is uh, uh, lacking. Now, the Central Arctic Ocean is a, is a case in point here, because we do not know so much about what fish stocks there are there, and what is their status. So it would be appropriate uh, then to take interim measures and so states should commit not to engage in fisheries in the high seas area of the Ar Central Arctic Ocean until information on fish stocks there and their status uh, is available. This obviously calls for more scientific research in the area as Johan Sigurjonsson also mentioned. Now, there is also under the UN Fish Stocks Agreement the duty to establish RFMOs, regional fisheries management organizations, in areas where there are none available. Uh, 
There has been uh, some discussion on the po possibility of extending the NEAF area to cover also Central Atlantic Ocean or to extend the NAFO area to cover it. But I think neither is, is likely to happen. More likely is, uh, is a, a establishment of a new organization to cover the parts of the Central Arctic Ocean that are not already covered by, by NEAF. Uh, uh, it, it seems that most states that have been discussing these issues are willing to take these uh, commitments of, of interim measures, not to uh, fish in the area until we know more about it. It may not be necessary to establish an RFMO unless, uh, until we know whether commercial fishery in the area is possible. But it might be possible to prepare for the establishment of an RFMO so that it could be established very quickly if and when the uh, uh, fishing possibility uh, comes to shore. Uh, and the final question then is, which states should be involved in this process? There has been some discussion and sensitivity about that issue. The five so-called coastal states up in the Central Arctic, Denmark on behalf of Greenland, US, Canada, Russia, and Norway, they have already met and discussed the issue. This classification, however, may be questioned, as there are only four states, namely Denmark on behalf of Greenland, Canada, US, and Russia, that have exclusive economic zones adjacent to this high seas area that is not covered by, uh, by, by NEAFC. Norway is to the south of that area, and it may be uh, argued that Norway is not a coastal state with respect to the uncovered area in the high seas of the Central Arctic Ocean. Now, my point is not to say that Norway should not be included in the process, but rather my point would be that it does not make sense to narrow the participation down to four or five states, but rather all the Arctic eight, so also Iceland, Sweden, and Finland should be included in this, in this process uh, in order to, uh, and, and it is quite possible to use the Arctic Council uh, as a, a forum for this uh, work, even though the Arctic Council does not formally have competence on fisheries, in this initial phase it might make sense to make use of the Arctic Council, which has been very successful in reach, reaching agreement in recent years on, on several issues, as you may know. And actually, in order to prevent future overfishing in this area, it would probably also be necessary to include other major uh, fishing entities, uh, both in Europe and in Asia. So this would include the EU and also the uh, Korea, China, and Japan from the Asian side. Uh, now this would, I think, provide for, provide for a, a closure to the issue uh, and be uh, necessary in order to prevent any, any overfishing, any untimely fishing in this in this future area. Now, those were my concluding remarks, but I would, I would like to offer you the chance to maybe make a, a couple of questions if you, if you have them. Uh, hello, I'm Janelle Knox Hayes from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and I had a question for Michael. Michael, I thought your presentation was very interesting, and I could see a number of beneficial applications for the creation of data systems that can manage or monitor ship activity in the oceans. But I also think there are serious ethical implications, because with that kind of data comes a tremendous amount of power. So my question is, who governs the creation and use of data at Google? And particularly, is Google uh, working to have any kind of stakeholder dialogue or open discussion about the governance of data creation and use. Well, that... Are we on? We on? Yeah. So, I, maybe I wasn't clear. It, it's not that Google will have the data. It's that the technology to gather such data exists, and Google's been helping people that are doing that. So, in the case of fisheries, it may well be that uh, those who fish are secretive about where they fish, and they don't want other fishermen to know, or anybody else? I, I don't know, I have no opinion about that, about public policy, but the search and rescue people should know, even if the public doesn't know. Now, as far as the data that we at Google capture, it's public data, or else it's private for our users. So the fishing boat is not a Google user, so, so that kind of data really wouldn't be 
our kind of data. Now what we've done is we've worked with some people that, that gather that data and make it available around the world. We've written software to show them how to do that. And that software that I showed is available, it's open source software available to anyone. Just ask Jennifer for that. But uh, I would say it, the responsibility lies with whoever's using the agency. So that's, that's the literal answer. The, if you wanna know how does Google feel about it, we feel that basically when you collect data, it needs to be used for the purpose for which you got agreement to collect it. So that, that's how you know you're obeying your kind of ethical contract. And so we do that with our users by having them agree to what we're gonna do. But I don't see fishing boats as our users. I just think our servers might be helpful. Uh, our computers hosting the European Space Agency's uh, Sentinel-1 data might be helpful if we give that for free to people. So we can help scientists get access to data that otherwise they couldn't get. And that's, that's really public science data. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Michael. I'm afraid we can only take one more question. It's the last question. Um, thank you. Uh, I walked into the building today to notice that Don Carlo is being shown downstairs and that opera can be seen as a misunderstanding between father and son. And I think we face a similar situation here. If we look at the Central Arctic and try to address it in a purely sectoral sense around aspects such as fisheries, and should we not taking into account the, the challenges that were outlined by Guylaine in particular, uh, have a more holistic uh, approach to how to govern the central Arctic. I'm looking at Arctic governance at, at Harvard, and I think that wider framing around biodiversity needs to be part of that. So I would ask Judge Haider how one can interpret UNCLOS and the future Arctic regime to get to a more holistic governance of fisheries that takes into account the broader biodiversity and ecosystem aspects of the marine environment. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Torsten. And also for reminding people of Don Carlo. I, I, I'm on the board of the opera, so this was a very uh, thankful comment. It, it is tonight at 8 o'clock. There may be a few, few seats available. Uh, this is a very complex question. I, I will need to be very, very brief. Uh, I think. Uh, in, in terms of fisheries management, I think states have obviously been moving towards an ecosystem approach, looking not only at its stock in isolation, but at, for example, in, in Iceland, at the, at the uh, relationship between cable and, and cod, to mention the two most important fish stocks here. Uh, I think also we, are, we have been moving a lot into uh, protection of, of the marine environment and biodiversity, uh, uh, so to protect vulnerable marine ecosystems from destructive fishing practices, closing areas, for example, where we have uh, uh, corals on the, on the seabed from, from bottom fishing gear. But, but otherwise, I think uh, states are gen generally now still in, in, a, in a sectoral approach, and, and so dealing with fisheries as such, and then they are dealing with shipping in, in other fora, etc. And, well, I think it has been uh, sort of uh, the custom review, at least here in Iceland, that a sectoral approach is more uh, a realistic approach than, than a, a fully integrated approach. But of course, that does not mean that we, we shouldn't be, be uh, coordinating between these sectors, and that, that certainly is, is being done. But this was an extremely complicated question, and I'm giving a very simplified answer. Look forward to discussing it during the break of Don Carlo tonight, thought Thorsten. Thank you. So thank you all the speakers and, and you the guests for your attention. Thank you very much.